Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Tuesday the 4th of July and a very happy Independence Day to all our American friends. I think you probably made the right decision. Now, just to let you know if you want to watch today's video or not, it's about the increase in the prevalence and the incidence of type 1 diabetes. Now, the incidence is the number of new cases. So there's been, um, actually in the first year of the pandemic, it was a 14% increase in type 1 diabetes. In the second year, it was a 27% increase in the incidence of type 1 diabetes. Now, these are the number of new cases. But the thing is, once type 1 diabetes has arisen, it never goes away. People have got it for life. And this study is in under 19-year-olds. So these people are going to have to be injecting insulin for the rest of their lives on a daily basis to sustain life. This will be a life essential intervention that they take insulin forever and it needs control and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a life it's a life changing disease. And um, it's got implications th throughout life and there can be long term complications. So the the import of a 14 percent and then a 27 percent increase in the incidence, the new cases of uh, type one diabetes is going to increase the prevalence, the number of cases that are around for decades into the future. Um, so this is really quite a significant finding. Now, let's get straight down to some of the details. Um, so in, this is this is from this paper. It's actually from the uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. So well-respected peer-reviewed work. Systematic review and meta-analysis just published at the end of last month. A lot of the work comes from Toronto, but they took papers from all over the world. So they looked at a lot of European data, a lot of North American data. And this is an international uh, trend that's happened during these two years. Now, has this trend been increased in the third year of the pandemic? We don't yet know. If it has, it really is becoming quite alarming because this is a great burden of morbidity into the future for all the individuals concerned and, of course, the economic costs as well. And this is bad in, uh, in every perspective, really. So we need to get to the bottom of this and find out what's causing it to try and stop it. Um, so key points, uh, 42 studies, uh, over 100,000 youths involved, all under the age of 19. And as we say, that means they're going to have this disease for a long time into the future. Incidence of type 1 diabetes was high during the COVID pandemic compared to years before the pandemic. The findings suggest the need to elucidate possible underlying mechanisms to explain temporal changes. So the temporal changes are the increase in the first and second years of the pandemic. Why is that? This is a direct quote from the authors. We need to find this out. So what is going on here? Why is there such a dramatic increase? And how can we stop um, the incidence of new cases in the future? The cases that we already have, medical science at the moment cannot reverse them. We can only manage it through lifelong insulin administration unfortunately um synthesized uh, estimates to change in incidence rate so they took all the different studies put it all together and they worked out these uh, new incident rates around the world now um the minimum observation period for the study was 12 months before and 12 months after so they could compare the prevalence or the incidence rather of diabetes before the pandemic and after the pandemic. And they also looked at this condition, DKA. Now, DKA is diabetic ketoacidosis. It's what happens in type 1 diabetes if people don't have their insulin. So unfortunately, some people with type 1 diabetes who develop it, it's not picked up at an early stage. It's picked up at a slightly later stage when people already have this diabetic ketoacidosis, which is bad because it's a serious medical condition. And it's also bad because people that have diabetic ketoacidosis on presentation are often more difficult to control uh, to control their blood sugar levels into the future. Um, so it looked at that as well. So the results for type 1 diabetes incident rates, uh, well, the qualifying number was 38,149 youths throughout the world. First year of the pandemic, the risk was 1.14, so that's a 14% increase during the first year of the pandemic. And the second year of the pandemic, it was even worse. So the first year of the pandemic, of course, is 20, 2020, and this is 2021. Uh, 27% um, increase. This is really quite a huge 
increase in type 1 diabetes. Now for type 2 diabetes, well, just before we say that, um, the expected rate, now there has been an increase, this is European data, the rate of type 1 diabetes has been increasing in Europe, this is European data, in this particular instance, 3 to 4% increase for the past few years. So we would expect it, if this trend had been followed, a 3, per, three to 4% increase, but we got a 14 and then a 27% increase. This is statistically significant. It's a huge increase. Why had it been increasing uh, up to this time? Different reasons. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. The immune system attacks the beta cells in the pancreatic islets. Insulin is only produced in these beta cells in the pancreatic islets. One of the reasons might well be that uh, children are too clean, this so-called hygiene hypothesis. Lack of bacterial challenge in early life. But there's other factors. There's genetic factors. There's early life diet. There's lack of breastfeeding. So it had been increasing anyway, but now we have this dramatic increase, way more than we would expect, which is the key thing we're talking about today. Type 2 diabetes I think most of you probably know the difference. Type 1 diabetes is typically juvenile onset, though not always. But type 1 diabetes is autoimmune destruction of these beta cells. So there is an absolute deficiency of insulin. Without insulin, these people will die. Type 2 diabetes, either the insulin is not used properly or the body doesn't produce enough insulin. Typically, there is a condition called insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. Normally occurs later in life, but not always. When type 2 diabetes occurs in children, it's usually a combination of a genetic predisposition and a, a very bad uh, ultra-processed food diet, often combined with lack of exercise. So the type 2 diabetes, there was an increase, but the study really didn't have enough data to quantify that, so there's no figures for that. But there is some increase in type 2 diabetes, also concerning. DKA, the increase in diabetic uh, ketoacidosis, uh, 15 studies were able to qualify for that. And again, there was a 26% increase in that. So why was there an increase in diabetic ketoacidosis being admitted to hospitals around the world? Um, part of this could be because the diabetes was picked up late because of COVID restrictions and medical problems. But it's also possible that the type 1 diabetes that we're getting is having a more acute onset that's presenting as diabetic ketoacidosis rather than the classic symptoms such as uh, thirst, uh, polyuria, uh, increased volumes of urine. So thirst, increased volumes of urine, weight loss and tiredness are the classic early features. So bear in mind, if young people are getting uh, large volumes of urine, thirst, unexplained weight loss or unexplained tiredness, they should be checked for their blood sugar levels and um, medical advice taken accordingly. The authors conclude from this, uh, further studies are needed to assess whether this trend persists. Let's hope it doesn't. Uh, but the data we have for the first two years of the pandemic is not good. And this may help to elucidate possible underlying mechanisms. That's what we need to find out what's happening. So that's basically the story. This is a concerning rise in the incidence of type 1 diabetes that will be with us for decades into the future unless some dramatic cure is found. But there's nothing likely to reverse uh, Type, type 1, to say type 2, type 1 diabetes. Um, there's nothing likely to reverse type 1 diabetes in, in the pipeline at the moment. Uh, this is going to go on for the rest of these individuals' lives. And that is a concern. We need to find out what is causing this. Um, the fact that there's been so little attention on this is surprising. Um, but there again, we've learned to be disappointed with mainstream media, I think, haven't we? Uh, let's go on and give a few more details for those that want it. Um, some studies reported an association between SARS coronavirus 2 infection and new onset diabetes. So is this caused by SARS coronavirus 2 infection? Well, it's very hard to tell because um, the, uh, this challenge in SARS coronavirus 2 diagnosis, most children, of course, who develop type 1 diabetes were simply not tested for SARS coronavirus 2. So the authors say, direct quote, there is concern about the validity of these studies. So um, the authors are not accepting on face value the fact that SARS coronavirus, well, the, the, the question as to whether SARS coronavirus 2 is causing more type 1 diabetes. 
um, data sets used for other studies did not capture asymptomatic SARS coronavirus 2. So, of course, um, perhaps, well, I think we can say pretty well all of the children in the world have been exposed to SARS coronavirus 2. The vast majority of them, or virtually all, have been infected by SARS coronavirus 2. Um, so, it's not surprising that the people that are developing type 1 diabetes have had SARS coronavirus um, because it's everywhere. So we can't really take much from that. And the, the other thing, this is the thing that's really important to me. The authors say this, there's no clear mechanism by which COVID-19, that's SARS coronavirus 2 active infection, could directly or indirectly lead to new uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So what the authors are saying here, well, some people have said that SARS coronavirus 2 can cause 1 diabetes, but we don't accept the evidence for it. And um, and uh, there's no mechanism by which it would no no mechanism by which it would cause type one diabetes. Although we will be looking at a possibility shortly if you want to stick around for a bit more detail. Uh, so purported direct mechanisms: SARS coronavirus two um, entry receptor. So the ACE two receptor is on the insulin producing beta cells. Right now, this is important to me. What we're saying is that the beta cells, the pancreatic islet beta cells, the pancreatic islets of Langerhan, as we used to call it, the beta cells in there do have these ACE2 receptors on the beta cell. And of course, it's the ACE2 receptor that fits in, the spike protein fits into. So if the spike protein, regardless of where that spike protein came from, that can fit into the ACE2 receptor site on the pancreatic beta cells. Now the question is, does the spike protein fitting into the ACE receptor, the angiotensin converting en enzyme receptor site on the, uh, the surface of the beta cell, does that in some way uh, damage the beta cell and start off an autoimmune process of destruction in that beta cell? Um, it's an open question. But we certainly have the, damage, the, the potential, the physiological potential for spike protein damage here. They do say direct, quote, there is no clear underlying mechanism explaining the association between sars cov virus 2 infection and subsequent risk of diabetes. And yet we have this uh, ACE2 receptor, which is amenable to the spike. So it does sound a little bit like they're contradicting themselves here. I think they are leaving the, mechanism, the door open for this possible mechanism of spike protein damage. Population-based studies suggest that the increase in the incidence may be due to immune-mediated mechanisms. So the authors looked at population-based studies and said, well, there could be an immune mechanism here. And this makes sense because the destruction of all the beta cells and therefore the eradication of insulin-producing capacity in the body... Um, is uh, an uh, autoimmune, an immunological disease, where the beta cells are all immunologically attacked. And if all the immunological attacked beta cells die off over time, as they do, then there's nothing left to produce insulin. We have this absolute deficiency of uh, insulin. Proposed direct effects of the COVID-19 but, but, uh, sorry, proposed indirect effects of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and containment measures may be associated with diabetes. Now, this is contrary to what would be expected based on the decreased viral infections amongst children. So what this is, what this is saying is that um, it's postulated that some type 1 diabetes is caused by intercurrent viral infections. But given that children were largely locked down in the early stage of the pandemic, they would have less interaction with other children, therefore less exposure to these viruses, therefore we would expect the beta cells to be less exposed to these viruses, therefore we would expect less type 1 diabetes, not more. This is the opposite of what we would expect. We would expect lockdown effects to reduce type 1 diabetes, but we're not seeing that, so is it some other factor? that occurred during the pandemic that's causing the increase in type 1 diabetes rather than these mechanisms. Because lockdowns, in theory, should reduce the amount of type 1 diabetes.
and catch up given that there was a delayed potential delayed diagnosis well it's pretty obvious when children develop type 1 diabetes but that would only affect the first year of the pandemic and as we say in the second year of the pandemic the increase in incidence was 27 percent so that does not explain it so there we go some mysteries to be explained but we do know that the beta cells have an ACE receptor which could be affected by the presence of spike protein. More research desperately needed because the implications of this are simply huge for the individual and ongoing for, as we say, many decades into the future. So urgent research required. That's all I want to say about that for today. Now, uh, but just before we finish, um, uh, Tim has written in, who, who's an expert in, in microbiological uh, um, war, warfare and things like that. And uh, yesterday, day before, we did, we did a video looking at the um, origins of SARS coronavirus 2. And I concluded that I, I was sure this wasn't a deliberate biological warfare agent. And I still believe that. Um, because human beings are capable of making biological warfare agents, viruses, that have, have a very high lethality. But Tim's written in to, um, and I'll, I'll put the de details of Tim's argument in the text at the bottom. He's written in, uh, and just see if you can follow this, quite interesting. Reflections on yesterday's lab leak video and biological warfare. So Tim says this, as someone who has spent a number of years studying biological warfare and ways to defend against it, I'm not convinced that the Wuhan virus, virus was not meant to be a biological warfare agent. Now, we're not saying it was, but this is an argument to say that it could be. I'm not convinced that the Wuhan virus was not meant to be a biological warfare agent. High lethality isn't necessarily required to be an effective weapon, it just needs to be able to incapacitate a significant number of people. The incapacitated people are no longer able to do their jobs and the added benefit to the employer of the weapon is that those incapacitated people now take up more resources and more people to treat them than if they died. And I know this is the case with some uh, biological warfare gases. They're not designed to kill you. They're designed to incapacitate because that means the incapacitated person can no longer fight, but it might take two other people that could have been fighting to look after that uh, wounded person. This is, of course, how cynical weapon design is. Um, Tim goes on, also the genetic techniques that they used, techniques that made it difficult to identify any man-made changes. So we looked at this. There the, the, the seems to be a deliberate uh, track covering attempt here to cover man-made changes um, techniques that made it difficult to identify any man-made changes is in line with one of the main attractions of biological warfare and here we have the phrase plausible deniability so it's plausible deniability and we've seen this phrase so many times around the world in weapons being supplied so um I put that. I will put that. Um, I'll put that. This is this is Tim's reasoning here. I will put it on the um, on the notes underneath because I think it's a very good, uh, but very simple, um, very simple uh, explanation of a possibility. And we have to be open to all potential lines of discussion and evidence, and reject some, um, but leave others on the table. So we'll leave that one open and renew our call for urgent investigations into why there is um, a 27% increase in 2021 of the incidence of new cases of type 1 diabetes. I mean, it, I mean I've been treating type 1 diabetes all my life. This really is quite concerning. It's an ongoing, ongoing issue and the complications of diabetes. And yet this huge increase Quite, quite concerning, really. Anyway, let, let's, uh, and even more, it's also concerning that 
more is not being discussed about this. You're as up to date as I am on that. Thank you for watching.